So let's stand together as we sing.
eternal and abundant that we might have freedom so much out of what is just apparently another baby. But it's not another baby. It is God, eternal, creator of all, being clothed in his creation and bringing hope and light into the lost and dying world that sin and death might be defeated. Lord, help us to remember the hope that we have and to carry it with us as we go to bring the light of Christ to a lost and dying world. Lord, as we continue to worship you today through the giving of, of gifts, through the preaching of your word, may your spirit continue to move among us, touching our hearts and changing us to be more like Christ. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.
uh, that. But I know that 36 people from my Antioch Baptist Church got saved that night because uh, Pastor Esther baptized 36 people on one, one Sunday night. It was an awesome and amazing service, and I have never forgotten. This has been one of my favorite passages of Scripture ever since. The woman at the well in John chapter 4. But let me set this up for you. Because before we have John chapter 4, we have John chapter 3. Now, what's the most famous verse of Scripture in all of the Bible? John 3.16, that's right. And what does it say? You see, y'all heard that one before. That's a good one. Okay. I'm just making sure you've heard it before. So John 3.16, most famous verse of Scripture in all the world. And Jesus tells this verse of Scripture. Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, uh, a religious leader. Now, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they grew up thinking that they were kind of special. All right? Because the, the, the Jews are God's what? God's chosen people. That's what they were talking about. We're God's chosen people. We are the chosen people of God. And uh, they, uh, they didn't understand, I don't think, what God really meant by that. God chose them to be His people and blessed them and uh, was their God so that every other nation in the world could see them and see that they had a God and that their God was real, right? That's what God's plan was, was that all the nations would be blessed through Israel, right? That's what God, that was good. God's plan was that all nations would come to, to, to saving knowledge and faith in Christ, but that, that they would, if the gospel was for the Jews first. He wanted to use the Jews to send the gospel out to every uh, person on the face of the earth. But the Jews, Jews did not love their neighbors. <laughs> not, not very well. Uh, they were not very good at loving their neighbors. Do you remember the story of Jonah? How many of you remember that story? Right. Well, God told us Jonah, says, go over there to Nineveh and tell the Ninevites they need to repent. What did Jonah do? He went the other way. Why did he go the other way? Was he afraid to tell them about God? No. He didn't want them to repent because he it says in the book of Jonah, I know you're a merciful God. I know you're a loving God. And you would forgive these people. Uh, and that's not what he wanted. He wanted God to destroy them. He wanted God to bring fire down and destroy them. Uh, he, he didn't love his neighbors too good. Uh, by the time you get to John chapter 4, you'll see that uh, the neighbors of the Jewish people were the Samaritans. Uh, and the Jews did not love the Samaritans at all. They didn't love them at all. But listen, the good news is this. I mean, yeah, I'm going somewhere. I know I'm taking them. <coughs> the good news is this. For God so loved the world. See, see, the good news is for God so loved the world. Because that's you and me. We're not Jews. We're Gentiles, right? Anybody, a Samaritan, they were half Jew, half uh, Assyrian. They were not considered Jews. They were considered uh, half-breeds by the Jewish people. They would be like you and I. They would be Gentiles. Listen. God tells them in John chapter 3 that He loves the whole world. I come to die for the whole world. I want the whole world to go to heaven. And then in John chapter 4, He proves it. He proves it. That's good news. Listen. John chapter 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had baptized and had Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. Now, stop right there. He says he needed to go through Samaria. Listen, he didn't need to go through Samaria. He could do like every other Jew of his day. When they would get to Samaria, they would take a left turn and they would walk. They didn't have cars, right? They, they walked everywhere they went. They would walk 30 miles out of their way and walk around Samaria. Now, I don't know how long it would take you to walk 30 miles. I could probably do it in three or four days. Maybe a week, tops. But rather than walk through Samaria, okay, rather than walk through Samaria, they hated the Samaritans so bad, they would walk around Samaria. Uh, it would add at least a day or two to their trip. They didn't care because they felt like if they went through Samaria, they would be unclean because Samaritans were half-breeds. They're not even human. They made up all these rules. Rules. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes the church makes up rules. Not to make us better Christians, but to keep people we don't want out. 
You know, when I first came here, every week it seemed like somebody would come to my office and say, Pastor Kevin, you can't do such and such. I said, why not? They said, we got a rule. <laughs> where's the rule? Where, where does it say that? Well, it's not written down, but it's a rule. <laughs> you know. Listen, they had all these rules. A Jewish man could not even uh, touch a cup that a Samaritan touched. If a Samaritan touched it, and you're a Jew, a Jewish rabbi, you wouldn't touch that. You wouldn't touch a Samaritan. Why? Because they thought it makes you unclean. They hated the Samaritans. <laughs> and Jesus, it says, he had to go through Samaria. So point number one is this for you. You want to write notes? Point number one. Jesus had a divine appointment. He didn't have to. It was the shortest direction. It was the shortest way to get to where he was going. But no other Jew would have gone that way. They would have gone 30 miles out of their way, going around. But Jesus had a divine appointment. A divine appointment is anytime God sets up a situation and He puts you in the right place at the right time so you can minister to somebody else. Jesus had a divine appointment with this woman at the well, a Samaritan of another culture or another race, and He was going to share the gospel with her. Divine appointment. If you want to have a good year in 2020, okay, New Year, right? Everybody said. Uh, goals, you want to have a good year, then listen, God's going to set up divine appointments for you all throughout this year. The question is, are you going to be obedient and willing to do what God wants you to do when He puts you in that place? What's a divine appointment? Well, I remember when I was a, a teenager, um, uh, there was a family that came to, to my, our church in our youth group, Stephanie Tompkins. I thought she was pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, she had a brother named Charlie, Charlie Thompson. Tompkins. Uh, you might remember him. Charlie was trying to straighten his life out, trying to get his life right. And but he went to work and um, there was a, a tragic accident at his workplace and Charlie Tompkins died. He died. And they had his funeral right here at Antioch. I remember it was in the middle of the day because half the school got out of school and came to the funeral. And I came to the funeral and I watched the funeral and then it was time to go home. I got in my car. And my Z28 Camaro, I loved it. It would, it would go so much faster than John's little box. And I would drive. I got in my Z28 Camaro to go home. And I come down here to Alice Road and I turn to the right. And I'm going down the road. And I heard this voice in my ear. You say, was it an audible voice? No, I don't think it was an audible voice. Just a voice in my head. And the voice in my head said, turn left at the railroad track. And I thought, why would I turn left at the railroad track? I'm going to my mama's store. Voice in my head said, turn left at the railroad track. So I said, well, you know what? Maybe this is God. Why would God want me to do that? I don't know. But I turned left at the railroad track. It was at Durwood Road, went down Durwood Road, came to the stop sign. I said, all right, God, what do you want me to do now? And, and the voice in my head said, turn left. I said, we're going right back to the church, God. What's more we going to do? And we got back to Alton Road. The voice in my head said, turn left again. And I turned left. I said, God, I'm right back where I started from. But there was a little car in front of me, a little great car. And I followed that car. We got to the stop sign there, Allenton Grocery. And the little great car had uh, another student from my school, Littlefield, in it. Her name was Beverly. And Beverly went to pull out a, and go across 211 there. But she didn't see a car coming, and she pulled out from the car. The car hit the front of her car. Then that car spun out and flipped over in a ditch. I, I don't know. She gets out of the car. She is screaming and yelling. She is, in fact, she thinks she's killed somebody. And I'm sitting right behind her. I get out of my car. I run up. I, I help her. Uh, we make sure the people in the car, they're hurt, but they're not dying or anything. Uh, we, we call the police. Police are coming. I'm right there. I hold her hand. I'm calming her down. Calm down, Beverly. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay, Beverly. Everything's going to be okay. In that moment, that's a divine appointment. You see, I didn't have to turn left, but if I had not turned left and left and left, I would not have been behind Beverly. I would have already gone through the intersection. But God put me in the place He wanted me to be at the exact moment He wanted me to be there so that I could minister to Beverly. Does that make sense? Are you tracking with me so far? Listen, God wants to put you in places where you can be a witness all this year. I, I, at the last election, right? Whether you voted for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, I don't care. I, I, don't, I don't care. It's a, that's, a, that's a personal thing, okay? Uh, now, I remember sitting 
at an auto repair shop waiting to get my car fixed. And it took them forever, ever to get my car fixed. How many of you like waiting? At the auto I'm not a good waiter, okay? I'm sitting there, they turn the TV on, and this lady comes and sits down right beside me. I, I do not know this lady. And she's watching something about Trump and Hillary Clinton. And she says, who are you voting for? I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. I'm, I'm telling you the story. Don't get mad at me, okay? This is just me, okay? This is how I feel. I said, well, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. Now, if you didn't vote for Donald Trump, don't, don't, don't turn me off, okay? <laughs> she said, why would you vote for Donald Trump? I said, that's a good question. I said, because I'm a born-again Christian. And I said, Hillary Clinton believes in abortion on demand. If Hillary Clinton becomes president, she'll be in favor of killing, murdering <coughs> millions of children all over the United States. And Donald Trump, he's against it. I can care less what Donald Trump is than anything else. I can care. He could be the worst president on earth. I don't care. Because I'm going to tell you how I vote. This is just me. I vote on one issue. When I go up to Allenton and all you stand up, people stand up there and they hand me this card, I'm leaving that card. You know, it does not tell me what I need to know to vote for you or not. You put on the back of your card, I'm against abortion, and I'll vote for you. Because I don't think Jesus, this is just me, I just don't think Jesus would vote for anybody that's in favor of killing children. Amen? We wouldn't have abortion in this country if the church would stand up and say that. The reason we have it is because the church has been silent. It's just my opinion. Now, if you voted Democrat, that's fine with me. I still love you. All right? That's just my conviction in my mind. All right. So Jesus had divine appointment. God wants to give you divine appointments. In fact, uh, I, this gracious, I forgot to uh, in fact, uh, God has divine appointments set up for you coming up in the next two weeks. Did you notice? We're having a revival. We've got a speaker coming. His name? What's his name? How many of you ever heard him speak before? How many of you ever heard of him? Tyler Blue's coming. There's 300 posters out there. All right, let's find out if, you're, if you want to have a, a, a divine appointment. 300 posters out there. Take a poster and hang it up somewhere. There's a, a thousand little business cards out there that has the exact same information. Take those business cards and give it to somebody. You might say, well, gosh, Kevin, I would do that if God spoke to me uh, like he did you and told me that there was somebody I needed to give it to. So let me ask you a question. So some of you are waiting for a sign. God, give me a sign. Do I need to witness this person? Do I need to invite this person to revive? You're waiting for a sign. I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question. How many of you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus and they're lost and they're going to hell? There's your sign. How many of you know somebody that doesn't go to church? You say, well, they might be saved. I don't know, but I, they, I, they don't go to church. There's your sign. Invite them to come to revival. Uh, you never know, but that if you invite them to revival, they that might be their divine appointment with God. I don't know much about Tyler Blue. When you look at him, you go, he looks awfully young. He's only 22 years old. But he preaches like a man far, far uh, older. He, uh, he's an old-timey preacher. He's going to preach. He's going to shout. He's going to get excited. And he's going to preach salvation like you haven't already preached before. In fact, there's some of you that probably get saved while you're there. And you're going to say, I thought I was saved, but no, I gave my life to Jesus. When you look at all these empty seats, does it make you sick? Or have you just grown so accustomed to it that it doesn't bother you? I'm going to tell you, it bothers Jesus. Because Jesus went 30 miles out of his way just to meet with one woman that nobody else in his day would even talk to. Because that woman had a divine appointment. Jesus had to go through there. All right, so verse number uh, five. It says, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sakar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The woman of Samaria came, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Remember. Remember all the rules? First of all, I didn't even say this. A Jewish man would not speak to a woman in public, right? That wasn't his relative. So not only is she a Samaritan, strike one, she's a woman, strike two. Most people wouldn't even speak to a woman. So she says, Well, you don't. Know, 
you ask me for a drink? The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She's shocked. And Jesus said, answered and said to her, verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the water said, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come to draw water here. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Now, we'll come back to there. Sometimes it's the little things in life that trip us up. It's the little things in life. Uh, for example, how many of you have ever done this? Sometimes it's the little things in life that trip us up. Uh, I love it sometimes, every now and then, when my wife will look at me and she'll say, Have you seen my glasses? Where's my glasses? I can't find them. How many of you have ever done that? Where are they at? They're on your head, right? Right? Have you ever done that? They're right, they're right on your head and you don't know they're there. Sometimes it's the little things that trip us up. One time I had this kid in my youth group, his name was Michael Waters. Michael Waters, they tested him at school to see what his IQ was. Now, I don't, I don't know how the IQ thing is because they never tested me. <laughs> never got that test. Hey, I did better than when my little brother King went to kindergarten. They gave him a little test, right? Right. Here was his test. They, they asked him, it's a test to get into kindergarten. How many wheels does a car have? Kenny said, a whole bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here, I can pick up. <clears throat> so then they said uh, to Kenny, they said, uh, when do you eat breakfast? You know, the correct answer should be in the morning. Kenny said, when I get to the store. <laughs> Go get this one. That's awesome. So they were testing. This kid had an IQ of 150. 150 IQ. I think anything over 140 is considered a genius. All right. Uh, we went on a mission trip, and the crew chief for Michael on his on his crew was an engineer. This man said, "He said I'm an engineer." He said, "I graduated from NC State University." Uh, he said, "I have a, a, a degree in engineering." He said, "He said this kid." He said, "He goes to your church, right?" I said, "Yeah." He said. This kid can talk to me intelligently about things in my job that even students at NC State University that come and intern for us cannot talk to me about. He is the smartest kid I've ever seen. I said, really? Michael Waters? He was smart. Well, we got the bus. We were leaving to go home from the mission trip. <clears throat> and I went in the gas station to get some gas. Michael Waters got out of the bus and he goes to walk into the store to get a drink. And there's this big sign on the door that says, pull. And Michael Waters walked right into that door, boom, and fell over backwards. Genius. <laughs> hey, says, pull. I, I ran up there. I said, hey, Michael, you just got to pull it. <laughs> 160 right here, buddy. <laughs> you see, sometimes it's the little things that trip us up, like a little sign that says, pull. When Sandra had uh, uh, Lydia, when Lydia was born, Sandra, we had four kids, right? Uh, no, not Lydia. When Caroline was born, we had two other kids. I get them all confused. Uh, when Caroline was born, Sandra had had all she could take because Morgan was about five and Isaac was about three and, and she had a new baby and she just needed, I need some time. I need some quiet time. If you don't get these kids out there, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> We lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and the circus came to town, and it was awesome. I said, well, don't worry, dude. I'll take care of it. I'll take Isaac and uh, 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 Morgan to the circus. We went to the circus. We got there a little bit late, and all the good seats were taken. We had to sit up on the very top row uh, of the bleachers. So we sat up there, and we watched the circus. 
And they had an intermission, a halftime, right? <clears throat> At halftime, a whole bunch of people got up and left and didn't come back. So I said, hey, let's go down. We can sit on the front row. We sat on the front row. <clears throat> and they were getting ready for the next thing to happen. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to the circus before, but I could see through the door. I was looking right through the door where they lined the acts up. What's the next act? I could see what the next act was. And so I said, I better prepare my daughter Morgan because she's afraid of everything. And she's afraid of animals. Uh, at the beach one time, a dog came and just saw her and said, lick you, lick you, I'll lick you. And the dog just came trying to lick her and she just kept going deeper and deeper trying to get away from that dog. I thought she was going to die. Uh, if there's a spider in her room, dad! I'm going to kill the spider. Uh, that's all the women in my house. Uh, but I could see what was next. There was a man, and the man put on a gorilla suit. And he's going to do this little comedy routine where he come out and chase the woman around and act like he's going to throw water on her, but I knew it was going to be confetti. I mean, that's the circus, right? So I said, hey, look, see that little gorilla right there? That's a man in a gorilla suit. He's going to come out, and he's going to chase the woman around. And Morgan's eyes got real big. Isaac's eyes got real big. And sure enough, the man comes out. He starts chasing the woman around. He's chasing him around. He's chasing him around. And, and he chased him over to our side. And we're in the bleachers. We're not even down there where he's at. As soon as he came over to our side, Morgan said, Ah! And she grabbed me by the head and started climbing up on my shoulder, on my head. That scared Isaac to death. He didn't know what was going on. Isaac grabbed me by the head from the other direction. And he was, they were climbing on top of my head. Morgan got on top of my head. I don't know how she did that. And would not let go. I said, Let go! Let go! The gorilla saw this and stopped watch. <laughs> he thought it was so funny. He came over and was waving, hey, and he tried to, it's just me, I'm in a gorilla suit. He was talking to her and she screamed even more. Ah! I'm talking gorilla. I'm standing up and I can't get Isaac to let go of my head. And everybody in the circus was laughing. They're going, ah! It was all I could do to get them out. I had to take them out. They're screaming, they're crying. They wouldn't stop. I, I got them outside. They wouldn't go back in. Sometimes it's the little things in life that trip us up. It's not the big things. For the story of the woman at the well, uh, it's, the, it's, it's not the big things that trip, trip her up. Maybe you're like this. Maybe it's not the big things that trip you up as well. In fact, I'll bet you, if I ask you to come up here on the stage and say what your biggest sin is, like confess it to the congregation, Probably none of you would come up here and go, Hi, my name is Kevin. I just want to confess to you that my biggest sin is murder. I just can't stop killing people. It's so much fun. That's probably not going to be your greatest sin, right? But now, now if that is your greatest sin, if it is, in just a little while we'll have an invitation. And I know that Pastor Doug is an excellent counselor. <laughs> He would be perfect to counsel you on that. <laughs> it's not the big sins that trip most of us up. It's not like murder. It's not like stealing. Most of you don't go out and steal from your neighbor. It's not like adultery. Most of you aren't cheating on your husband or your wife. Uh, most of you don't go out and get drunk on the weekend. It's not the big things that trip you up. It's the little things. Like how about gospel? Yeah. Talking about people. Or lying. Not being truthful. How about judging the people? How about pride? While you might not go out and cheat on your husband or wife, how about lust? Lusting after people. It's not the big sins that trip most of us up. It's the little sins. That's where we are. The woman at the well, uh, why do you think she was there at the well in the middle of the day? It says she came at the sixth hour. That's... The sixth hour starts at sunrise. Sunrise. So sunrise comes about six. So six hours later would be about noon. Why would she come at the sixth hour? Why would she come in the middle of the day? See, she came in the middle of the day because there was nobody else at the well. Hey, how many of you cut grass? How many of you, you cut your grass? Anybody cut your grass? How many of you? Uh, how many of you remember working in the back? How many? How many? How many, how many of you worked in the back on a harvester? I'm not talking about where you, you cropped it on foot and, and they had a, what do they call it? A, didn't even have wheels on it. I mean, a drag. They had a drag. They didn't even have wheels on it. That, you're old. You remember. 
that. Uh, but if you remember from the back, the, 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 the worst thing was the first time you got on that seat in the morning, right? The very first very first trip. Why was that the hardest one? Because the tobacco was wet. And by the time you, whoa, it was cold. I mean, it'd be July, but you would be freezing. By the time you got to the end of the road, you were soaking wet. Now, once you got wet, you're okay. You're going to right? dry. People, uh, I would rather be there in the morning when it was cold and wet than at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when it's like 105 degrees. Right? You cut your grass in the morning when it's cool or late in the evening when it's cool. Why did she come to the well in the middle of the day? It's because everybody else was going to be there. See, here's a woman who had a reputation. She had had five husbands, right? And the man she had now is not her husband. Everybody in town, uh, they didn't want to be around her. In fact, when she came, everybody would talk about her, I'm sure. There she is. You better watch your husband. <laughs> Don't let your husband get around her. <laughs> she was the town bad lady. And maybe she came in the middle of the day because she got tired of people pointing and laughing. Maybe she came in the middle of the day because she didn't have to wonder what they were thinking. She didn't have to feel guilty or ashamed. She came in the middle of the day because there was nobody else there. The woman had had five husbands. She didn't want to be there in the middle of the day. Don't you think she'd rather come in the morning when all the other women came? They would come together as a group. And they would laugh and they would talk and have fun. Here's a woman who had no friends. None. You think your life was bad. She had no friends. No one. Jesus says, give me some water. He says, well, you, you don't have any... Uh, you're, you're a Jew. Why are you even talking to me? Jesus tells her, if you knew who I was, you would ask for living water. I would give you living water. And she's all about the living water because he says she'll never thirst again. So she's thinking, she's thinking like physical water. Hey, give me some of that water. That way I don't have to come to the well in the middle of the day anymore. I don't have to do this anymore. Give me some water. How do I get that water? She's all into that. How do I get that water? Verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I give will never thirst again, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. See, this woman's problem is she's drinking from the wrong well. She drinks from the well. A well is anything in life that you think will make you happy. Anything in life you think will fulfill you. Anything you think in life will give you a purpose. That's a well. She's drinking from the wrong well. What well is she drinking from? What do you think? She's drinking from the well of husband. Right? Does this sound familiar? Have you ever seen anybody like this? Oh, man. Now, some of, the, some of you ladies, you started planning your wedding when you were five years old, okay? Um, uh, you just think you look pretty in a wedding dress, I think. Um, but some people, some women are like this. Man, if I could just get a husband. Man, if I had a husband, life is going to be good. Man, I can't wait till I find a husband. Uh, he's going to take care of me. Everything's going to be good. And that's when she, she found a husband. But it didn't work out. And he divorced her. Well, that's okay. You know, he, he was an alcoholic anyway, you know. He was drunk all the time. I'm not going to make that mistake again. If I can just find a husband that will go to church with me, then everything's going to be good. And she finds that husband, and he divorces her. Well, uh, uh, and it keeps going on and on five times to the point where she doesn't even want to get married anymore. She's like, hey, why get married? I'll just live with a man. She's looking for happiness in the well of husband, but it never satisfies her. It never makes her happy. And you and I are just like that. Maybe you're not looking for happiness in the well of the husband. I mean, maybe you're looking in a different well. What is your well? Her 
problem is she's drinking from the wrong well. She drinks from the well of husband. Uh, uh, sin will satisfy you for a while, but the problem with false wells is that they eventually run dry. You can choose to sin, but you cannot choose the consequences of your sin. To put your faith in any well but the well of Jesus will leave you spiritually dry and thirsty. If worship seems lifeless and hopeless to you, maybe you're drinking from the wrong well. We're no different than a woman, though. Think about this. This is how we think. Man, when I just, uh, students, how many of you think this? All right, so you're in seventh well, grade, seventh grade. How many of you think this? Man, when I just get to high school, then things are going to be better. I can't wait till I get to high school. Things are going to get better. And then you go to high school and you discover that you are like a freshman. <laughs> they stick your head in the toilet just for fun, right? And you go, man, I hate being a freshman. I can't wait till I get a car. When I get a car, things are going to be better. I can't wait till I get a car. Man. And then when you get a car, you discover. Now, is this not true? Those of you that can drive. It's, things really aren't that different when you get a car. It's just that now your mom makes you go to the grocery store and carry your little brother and sister everywhere you go. But man. My life really didn't change that much. I got a car. Well, when I graduate from high school, I'm getting out of this town. I can't wait to get out of London, this town. I get, I'm leaving this town. I'm going to go to college. It's going to be great. And then you, then you go, well, you know, when I get out of college, when I, I'll be happy when I get a job, when I get a good job. Once I get a promotion, then I'll be happy. Uh, when I get married, a boyfriend or girlfriend, or when I get married, then I'll be happy. Does marriage make people happy? Do married people ever fight? Who's married? Are you married or happy? It's a joke. Don't answer it. It's a true question. Don't answer it, guys. Don't fall for it. So then they get married and they say, well, you know what? Oh, man. I, I, I'm, I, he, he's going to become what I want him to become. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get him to do what I want him to do. Or I'm going to get her to do it. But they, they don't. And then they say, you know what? That's all right. I know how to fix this. When we have kids, then we're going to be happy. <laughs> how many of you would testify that if you don't have, if you're not happy before you have kids, having kids will not make you happy? Because <laughs> now all of a sudden you have no money. <laughs> Money, you have no time, you have no sleep. If we just had kids, we'd be happy. I, I hear people say that, and I just laugh. Good luck with that one. When I own my own business, I'll be happy. Or when I retire, I hear that a lot now. So I'm, I'm 53, so I'm thinking, hey, one of these days, I'll retire like when I'm like 90, and I'll be able to afford it by then. When I retire, I'll be happy. Listen, that's a lie from hell. There's only one thing that can make you happy, and that's to drink from the well of Jesus. Right? Amen. The woman's drinking from the wrong well. She's looking for happiness, but she can't find it. She can't find spiritual happiness or satisfaction because she's looking in the wrong place. But there is a well that can be found. It's the only drink that satisfies, and it's not a drink. It's a person. It's Jesus. So let me ask you this morning, what is your well? Let me finish the story real quick. It's time to go. Really time to go. Uh, let's go to verse number... Um, let's go to verse number 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am who? I am he. Listen. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman flat out that he's the Messiah. How many times, you go back and read your Bible, how many times in the New Testament in, in Jewish settings did Jesus say, don't tell anybody? Or he would say, I'm the son of David. I'm the son of man. He tells her flat out, he's the Messiah. Jesus loves everybody. Everybody. Even Samaritans. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. <laughs> Yet no one said, what do you see? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. And in the meantime, the disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat. 
of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, has somebody brought him some food to eat? Anything to eat? Jesus said to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there is still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Verse 39, last one. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. Okay, listen, I'm going to close this thing out. Listen. Now, my father-in-law is a pa pastor. He's retired. We argued all over Christmas break about the water pot. It just bothers me that the water pot is there. It says she left her water pot. And I said, what does that mean? He said, it doesn't mean anything. I said, it's got to mean something. It'll be in the Bible. <laughs> First of all, let me say this. Let me tell you what the water pot means. Number one, it means this. The person who wrote this story, the person who wrote this story was an eyewitness. They saw it with their own eyes because they noticed the water pot. I don't know why they noticed the water pot, but they, they noticed that water pot, and they made sure they put it in the story. It had to be written by an eyewitness. You say, well, how can we trust the Scripture? Because the Scriptures were written by eyewitnesses. What just a story it was written by an eyewitness. Uh, maybe the woman left the water pot because she was so excited. Ah, oh, he turned. Oh, I, just, I got this water. I got to tell everybody. So she leaves the pot. Maybe she left the pot because she knew she would be back. I'm going to go tell everybody, then I'll be right back. <laughs> Why well, take the pot? I'm coming back. Maybe she left the pot so Jesus could have some water. Hey, you need your spot. You get you some water. I don't know why she left the pot. But listen to this. Don't you listen. Sometimes you have to leave behind what you're leaning on in order to fully follow Jesus. The woman had a story to tell, and the story is no good unless you tell it. Don't think people won't listen to your story because you messed up. The whole town listened. Maybe you're not being perfect gives your story power. Grace can't be contained. It always overflows from the heart. I'm going to close by telling you this last story. I've been reading a little devotional book called Crazy Stories, Saying God. And the man who wrote this book, he, he uh, mentions the death of Osama bin Laden. How many of you ever heard of Osama bin Laden? Heard of him? He said, uh, it kind of made me sad when I heard that Osama bin Laden had been killed. Why am I reading this story? It kind of made me glad when he was dead, right? He said, um, he said, could you have imagined what would happen if they had captured him alive, maybe? What if they had captured him alive? He said, I know this would never happen, but he said, what if they captured him alive and they brought him back to the United States? And they put him in prison and they tried him, whatever. While he was there, someone shared the gospel with him and he became a Christian. And uh, maybe he served time. Maybe they let him go. And, uh, and, and he became such a good man that uh, they asked him, come and share a story. Could you tell us how you how you changed? And he would tell a story and people would listen. And people would say, well, if Saul and Laden can change, surely I can change. And, and, and maybe uh, political people would say, hey, come and give us advice. And what, what if he became the mayor of a town and he actually helped that town become a better town? He said, wouldn't that be a great ending to the story? He said, but I know it would never happen. Not fair. He said, you know what? It happened in the Bible. There was a man whose name was Saul, and Saul's only goal in life was to kill who? He wanted to kill Christians. How many of you are Christians? Well, you better not tell Saul. <laughs> he goes and, and he sees them kill Stephen. They stone Stephen to death, and it says they drop their clothes at the feet of Saul. And I had a professor in college who said, Saul never forgot the look on Stephen's eyes when Stephen looked up and he said, I see the gates. He said, I see the heavens open. And I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Where's, where do we always hear Jesus? He's, he's not standing. Where's he at? He's sitting. But when Stephen obediently gave his life and became the first martyr of the church, Jesus stood up. Because of his obedience. 
God knows what's going on on earth. And God is encouraging you. Be obedient. Says Paul never forgot the look on his face. He says his face was radiant. Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And they, he goes on into town. And, and a man who was a Christian prayed and opened his eyes. He was going to that town to kill that man. And that man prayed for him to open his eyes. I think probably most of us would not say, isn't that, isn't that Paul? That's the man who tried to kill me. That's the man who killed my brother. We wouldn't invite him to speak at our next men's breakfast, would we? But yeah, that's what they did in the Bible. This is it. I, I'm, I'm going to read something to you that I'm going to love. Because Christians today, Christians assume that bad people can't change. In the Bible... Christians assumed that a bad person could legitimately change. They knew that a bad person wasn't destined to stay a bad person. They knew that liars, adulterers, and yes, even murderers could experience real transformation because of the power of God. They refused to believe that Saul's past would define his future. They did not agree that the best predictor of future performance is past behavior. They believed that God could change people. That God wanted to change people. That God's greatest desire was to take totally depraved people and make them, remake them into saints they were designed to be. There's a lot of people out there that need to change. There's a lot of empty seats here. Just because we don't have a pastor doesn't mean we can't pack this church out, does it? Just because we don't have a pastor doesn't mean people can't get saved, does it? Have you given up? Just because we don't have a pastor doesn't mean that God's Spirit can't move in our midst, can it? You cannot have revival apart from confession of sin. That's the message of the story today. The woman confessed her sin. She confessed. She's drinking from the well of husband. And she gave her life to Jesus. And Jesus used her to change an entire village. God can use you to do the same. If you're obedient, He'll put you in the situations you need to be in. To invite the people to come. I guarantee you, this man will preach the gospel like you haven't heard it in a long time. <laughs> the question is, are you willing to be obedient? This morning, as we give the invitation, the altar's open. If you want to come and you want to... Uh, uh, get on your knees and confess your sins and pray. Say, Lord, we want revival. How many of you have been praying for revival? What if God answered every prayer you prayed this week? Would we have revival this morning? <laughs> it's not going to happen unless we pray for it, we ask for it, and then we're obedient to do what God leads us to do. Listen, I want to encourage you. Come get on your face before God and confess your sins. Ask God to send revival. Ask God to help you believe in, in the miraculous Changing power of God to change people's lives. That may, the world may say, well, that person will never change. But God doesn't say that. Maybe they will. If we believe them. And if we pray for them. And we invite them. I challenge you. Uh, uh, think about who you're going to invite to revive. Come and pray for them. If, you, if you're not a member of this church, we'd love to have you. We don't have to have a pastor for you to join this church. We will welcome you with open arms. Because you're awesome and amazing. And these are awesome and amazing people. Look at them. Some of them are looking at me kind of like they're mad. What will you do this morning? Please stand as we sing.
Wednesday night activities this week. Uh, it is New Year's, so Happy New Year's, everybody. To close out, we're going to do something a little different than we normally do. So there's a song, and I know you've heard it because it's on every movie or every TV show where New Year's comes up. It's called Old Lang Syne. Right? <laughs> Here's my question. Any of you ever sung that song? Yeah. Really? Wow. That's amazing. Because I've never met anybody who sung that song. Now I've met y'all, so I can't say that anymore. If you looked at the words of that song, most of them sound like gibberish because they're written in some kind of weird dialect. Um, but it's mostly about friendship and drinking. be singing the tune from Old Lang Syne, but it's got different words. It has words that reflect on what God has done for you and for me throughout our year and looking forward to what he's going to do in the next year to come. Uh, so, I know you know it, even though you've never sung it, so, won't you sing it? <laughs>
Lord, we look forward to what you will do in this new year. New revival, new pastor, new fire and new wind, new spirit pouring out on your people. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy New Year, everybody.